and I'll do it. Okay, hey everybody, this is Harvey Selgo Wasserman with, with you for the second hour of the 123rd Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition. We're gonna do a very brief opener uh, uh, to uh, announce uh, the rise of a new organization. Then we're gonna Camilla Reese, uh, one of the great leaders of the uh, various movements in this country. Camilla, good to see you. I know Dave Saltman is on with you as well. Uh, and Tim Sheckley, we're gonna talk about 5G, uh, but we can do a very brief introduction, Camilla, uh, before we get to, get to that with the great John Brakey, who's out there in Arizona. Talk about a third world country <laughs> fighting for democracy. <laughs> Arizona is certainly it. Um, we are launching, everybody, a, a new organization, the Alliance for Grassroots Democracy. Um, it is going to, we have a year and a half or so to focus on the upcoming 2024 election. Our primary focus is gonna be protecting elections, which John is a, a basic uh, founder of the election protection movement in this country. And, and also to funnel as much progressive money as possible away from the kinds of um, TV advertising that the major parties do and into grassroots organizing. You gotta ask yourself, which would you rather do? Spend $20,000 on 60 seconds on TV or get a thousand hours uh, of, uh, of grassroots organizing at 20 bucks an hour from kids knocking on doors. So the Alliance for Grassroots Democracy, we're gonna be launching over the next uh, couple of months and it's gonna go right through the 24 election and its focus is exactly what it says, grassroots democracy. Towards that end, we have just um, arranged for uh, the ability to uh, allow people to do conference calling uh, using the Zoom platform, unfortunately, but that's what we're with at the moment. Uh, and uh, people who uh, we're, uh, we will be able to accommodate a thousand people on every gathering and we will have a team, Mike Hirsch, uh, Wendy, uh, Myla Reeson, who will be able to conduct grassroots meetings uh, with uh, the, the platform for grassroots organizations. But the primary focus is on national grassroots organizing leading up to the 24 election. Camilla and I have discussed it. Uh, John Brakey, I wanted you to introduce it. And then we'll go to Camilla uh, Reese to talk about uh, uh, 5G and the national movement on that. So go ahead, uh, John Brakey, please. Well, thank you, Harvey. And uh, yes, uh, you know we are talking. We're excited about the opportunities between now and 24. I know speaking for my part is that uh, we are submitting, resubmitting the bill that we had last session that failed by one vote. And, uh, and you know, today, Ken Bennett, who former Secretary of State, who now has gone back to, into the Senate, uh, mainly because of push this bill and then help us nationally, because he'll be part of the team, is to make elections transparent, trackable, publicly verified in the state of Arizona with a with a ballot library index card system uh, that if you, it, when images are released, are released by precincts, uh, people can pull it down, they can add them up themselves, and then they will be able to go to this uh, library index system. And then as we're doing another audit across the system, proving the images are real, that they'll be able to go into the boxes. But the big thing about all of this, if this bill was to pass, we think it's gonna happen by April, and, uh, and hopefully we, we're gonna try to launch it nationally, find the funding to be able to go ahead and hire staff in other states and do what we do. Uh, Massachusetts is important, Ohio, very important. Michigan, we're already in Florida, North Carolina. Uh, you know, we have to make a move and, and, and you know, we have to be able to organize. And that's where it's important to find the funding to build an organization and bring in activists all across the country that we know that we've been working with and people who are on this call too. And uh, because realistically, if we don't wind up doing something like this, we're heading for big trouble. Still a right. lot of people don't believe elections. Uh, we, if we don't make this move, Harvey, well, let's just, in closing, okay. I know we're short on time, Transparency is the currency of trust, and without it, our democracy will die in darkness. So let me point out, remind everybody, thank you, John, fantastic. John is one of the great heroes of the election protection movement and had a huge impact in Arizona, 
And um, Ken Bennett, who he mentioned is a major Republican. Is he Speaker of the House or President of the Senate at this time? No, he uh, uh, wound up being the, believe it or not, he got education, he's the chairman, and the government committee is gone, and now it's elections, and he's in the vice chairman. In fact, that's why I was late, because I was in that committee watching it online, uh, okay. not with about our bill, but other bills in election. Okay, so state. if this bill passes the um, um, a legislature, uh, Ken Bennett is the highest ranking Republican we've had on these calls. If this gets through the Arizona legislature, which John will have a hand in, we can take it nationwide and make it a big piece of our election protection puzzle. And we'll have more on this, John, if you'll come back next week. I will, and just in closing, detail. the infrastructure is in place. It won't cost hard anything to do this, except they gotta buy the inkjets and put it back into the high speed <laughs> scanners. Well, uh, we'll, I think I know somebody will buy them for them, you know? Well, it's we'll that take small a price. And we'll start a, a national account at Staples so that people can yeah. buy inkjets for, yeah, for uh, marry the ballot to the image. <laughs> Thank you very much. So oh, keep following brother. us. John, you'll be back with us next week. Hopefully, we'll have Ray McClendon, okay. uh, Andrea Miller. We will have a national organization, uh, the Alliance for Grassroots Democracy, which is going to move as much money, resources, and human attention as possible to grassroots democracy uh, over the next year and a half leading up to 2024. John, you're an integral part of that. Thank you so very much. We have with us now uh, Camilla Reese. Camilla uh, is somewhere in the wilds of Connecticut and um, is a, one of the great organizers uh, on the issue of 5G, which is gonna segue. She's with Tim Sheckley, who she's gonna introduce. And we're gonna segue that into the, uh, the discussion uh, a, a of the energy use of, of 5G, which people don't think about much, and B, the, the war on solar, which is escalating every day. I gotta tell you, I saw on a right-wing site, I, it's hard to say this, they showed a picture of a, of a wind turbine on top of a tower exploding, as if windmills are now a danger to explode around the United States. There's really no end to these people. But Camilla has had a very strong personal experience with 5G, has done amazing uh, organizing on it. And one of the reasons for having her on is to integrate our various movements, uh, especially on the environment, into the very real dangers of 5G and the avoidable problems and the alternatives that we have uh, with 5G. So. Camilla, please take it away. We're really glad to have you on. Thank you very much, Harvey. And while I have focus on 5G and 4G and 3G and 2G, all the Gs, <laughs> um, through my uh, two websites, electromagnetichealth.org and Manhattan Neighbors for Safer Telecommunications, and through policy work done through the National Institute of um, for Science, Law, and Public Policy in Washington, where Tim Sheckley, who you're going to hear from later, is a senior research fellow. Um, Today, we're going to focus um, a little more on the smart grid. But before I go there, I want to have an update from Julie Levine regarding the decision on January 10th by the LA um, Board of Supervisors to approve changes to the county code that will allow faster rollout of wireless antennas throughout LA County. Um, they unfortunately paid no attention to the 183 written comments, the 40 formal letters of opposition, the over 600 pages of studies and letters from scientists about the risks of these antennas, an action alert by um, Children's Health Defense, and um, a 28-page legal analysis by Fiber First LA um, regarding the importance of uh, complying with the California Environmental Quality Act, which um, they, they chose not to do. There was one, um, one letter in favor of this ro accelerated rollout of antennas, which was from Verizon. They had a petition that had a th over a thousand names on it in support of wireless networks. And um, they have been researching the signatories to that petition. So far, they haven't found one legitimate person. They found people, many people who were dead uh, going back many years and other people whose name was on it that um, didn't know that had never signed it. So it's very disturbing. They are Fiber First LA is going to be initiating legal action on this subject. And uh, you'll hear more eventually from Julie Levine on this. 
In the meantime, if you want to be in touch with her, you can email her at 5gfreecalifornia at gmail.com or her number is 661-548-6577. So that's an update hey, on that. Um, 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 Camilla, give me the uh, uh, website again and I'll put it. Um, it's just an email address for Julie, 5gfreecalifornia at gmail.com. Okay, that's in the chat now. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, one of the, um, I had the great fortune of meeting Tim Sheckley, Dr. Tim Sheckley in Boulder many years ago when uh, I was talking to somebody there who said that, um, well, you're saying that all these smart meters are dangerous. And uh, Tim Sheckley is saying that they don't do what they're being claimed to do um, in terms of um, creating a true smart grid or integrating renewable energy technology. So we um, so we exposed that in a paper that was called Getting Smarter About the Smart Grid 10 years ago. Um, you could look at that at gettingsmarteraboutthesmartgrid.org. And it explained that a true smart grid would be able to integrate distributed renewable energy. And um, the explained the conflicts of interest in the business model of the big utilities that have um, they have no incentive to use less electricity and yet strong incentives because they get a, uh, to, to invest in large capital uh, equipment assets like uh, generation and transmission and, and uh, meter networks um, because they get a guaranteed rate of return on their capital investments. So basically this paper um, showed that, that we have been misled, the whole country, every, everywhere they're putting in the meters today, and then has been misled about the potential energy and cost savings of the smart meters. Just like we've been misled about the adequacy of wireless networks, which is another subject. We've also done a paper on that called Reinventing Wires. So the paper said that leadership is going to come from outside of the centralized model. And today we're going to hear from um, the leadership of Tim Sheckley, who has been, um, who is an energy systems engineer and an expert in international standards for the smart grid and home electronic systems. And um, he has been working on a tech technology um, that will be, will allow for um, uh, microgrids um, uh, and re basically renewable energy, locally controlled, locally resilient, community-based, decentralized, et cetera. And um, it's very exciting um, because it it's instead of going up and trying to change the current system, it is creating a better alternative. And um, they've got a couple locations in Colorado and in New Mexico where there are demonstration projects that are going to um, start. He's applied for a $12 million grant from the Department of Energy to um, accelerate the progress on this. But it, it it gives me great hope because it also allows for um, wired um, wired metering, um, you know, and no, no radio frequency exposures. So... Um, um, I uh, welcome you, Tim, and um, thank you for being here with us. And um, why don't you take it, take it away? Okay. Oh, there you are. Good. Thank you, um, Camilla. Um, well, I think you you <clears throat> teed it up very well. Um, the um, uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is what we where we go next with this the the smart meter. It goes back to I, you know, I was one of the people that was involved in developing the original standards for it, which was back in the uh, early 1990s. So they they call it AMI, Advanced Metering Infrastructure, but that's a little ironic because advanced was it was advanced in maybe in 1990, but it's no longer appropriate. So we basically what I've been working on for quite a few years, or in, in getting finally published, is a some standards for uh, the next generation smart meter and that would be really do what the original concept was supposed to be but got uh, really twisted by the uh, electric power industry and uh, particularly in 2008 with the uh, financial crisis then uh, and the money that was thrown at the smart meters it became totally um, distorted into something else that did not do what it was promising to do and still doesn't do any, any of what it what claim what is claimed by the utilities 
Um, basically, the, the purpose of, 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 of a smart meter is to measure, uh, to manage energy on the premises, to, to measure and manage. Um, and that's what the original prototypes that we developed did. And I, I did this development work for people like Southern Cal Edison and, and, uh, in the 1990s, Duke Power, uh, Northern States Power, F Florida Power. A lot of these companies uh, supported this work, but it was all low-key back, back rooms kind of stuff. And it didn't come mainstream until m decades later with the, uh, in, in 2008 mainly. Um, the, um, but uh, it, what, what ended up in the smart meter is not what we, we planned on, uh, because, not what was important because the meters just measure and transmit the data to a, uh, by usually by radio to the utility. That doesn't do any good at all. That doesn't manage energy. It's, despite what they say, it doesn't work. And it's, not, it's, it's never worked. And there's plenty of documentation of that now uh, but we've developed a new version that we call EMA, Energy Management and Measuring System. And it's really a home, uh, what we call a home energy management system or for homes and buildings. Uh, we developed this in the international ISO and IEC, International Standards Organization and International Electrotechnical Commission sponsor a, a standards committee called um, Home Electronic System. And I've been involved in that for many years. And uh, we have uh, a lot of momentum now trying to solve this problem and develop, we've developed a, a, a set of standards, probably over 50 standards by now, um, that and, and some of which are the latest ones are dealing with this particular system. It's called the HES Gateway, Home Electronic System Gateway. It's a device that uh, uh, interconnects uh, the devices in your house to whatever, to each other and to, and to external services, but it is primarily focused on preserving user uh, one, uh, several points: user privacy, secure cybersecurity, safety, uh, interoperability of products, and uh, most importantly, it's it's a hardwired system. It uses optical fiber, and uh, uh, to communicate with the external services and it protects uh, everything. It forms a firewall for your house. It also man uh, supports a, a variety of applications. And one of them is called this EMMA application, which you could consider to be the next generation smart meter. The idea is it's not just a meter. It's, it, does, it can report to a utility, but the, the process is entirely under the con control of the consumer and not the utility. It's uh, not a utility device. There may also be a, uh, a meter, uh, an another meter, and they could just have a dumb meter, uh, old uh, analog meter on the house that um, would serve the purpose. But um, <clears throat> the, the, the main purpose is to manage uh, the resources in the house, and particularly the emphasis is on solar and storage. Um, we uh, you know, s solar energy is, is, a, is um, um, uh, the cheaper and better, uh, but it's not getting than anything else, but it's not getting traction because it doesn't fit the institutional business model of the electricity grid and the electric and the investor owned utilities. Um, the, uh, um, <clears throat> The last thing that the utility company wants to see is solar panels on your roof. They want to own and control whatever resources you have, and bigger is better. They want giant wind farms, giant solar farms, because they return they get capital a capital uh, return of about ten percent on their capital assets. Uh, anything they invest money in, and as Camilla said, it's also metering networks, and. Uh, and these uh, big uh, uh, tra uh, transmission and distribution or generation and transmission. Uh, that's why they want to pour all the money into that. And they claim that it is uh, makes the grid res resilient, but it does not. It makes it vulnerable. The only way to get resilience is to dis is a distributed uh, 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 system. Um, which is what we envision. In other words, having a, a, a control system in each home that will allow it to have its own solar uh, sources, its own batteries, uh, and control its own appliances, and 
maybe communicate with other homes in the neighborhood to share electricity in what we call a microgrid. A microgrid is a, a detachable part of the electric grid. It's still connected to the electric grid, but it's it's det could be detached if necessary, or um, in the event of severe uh, uh, problems. And we see more and more examples of that right now with the failures in the uh, the electric power grid with severe weather events and and uh, attacks and and uh, you know look at what's happening in the Ukraine or even in North Carolina, the grid is is being attacked. And so it's not really um, appropriate. Uh, anymore. We don't need this huge, uh, complex and vulnerable electric power grid. If we can move uh, uh, it, it, as, we, as quickly as possible to a distributed solar. Um, okay, so um, a, a beautiful, Tim. Thank you for that. Um, let's go through in a, a, an organized fashion a couple of things. Um, uh, we want to have a major discussion in a couple of minutes on just what you said about the attack on solar. I know that Mark Rose is with us and has and a lot of great things to say, but uh, let me touch on one thing that Camilla and I discussed beforehand. Uh, Camilla, you have told me uh, that um, uh, there are plans to put many, many towers uh, for 5G in Manhattan, for God's sakes. And clearly they're per planning to do that in Los Angeles. Uh, where I have a daughter who teaches school in Manhattan, and my I have a family out here in LA. You're telling me, basically, telling us that there is a we're on the cusp of a major proliferation of huge 5G towers in our major urban areas. And you've also told me that there's an alternative that Tim knows a bit about. So if could you before we get into the solar the war against solar energy, which will really fill the rest of the hour. What what can you tell us about this proliferation of these towers? How dangerous are they? And what's the alternative? Well, first of all, it's there's the towers, but there's also a proliferation of antennas everywhere in our homes with the Internet of Things, outside with the coming Internet of Bodies, with the satellites transmitting RF. We're being bathed and in this radiation. Now, in New York, they have um, announced there are about 4,000 um, a year ago that were announced that um, are gonna be put up there, these enormous jumbo cell towers that you would see normally on the horizon, um, but they are gonna be on residential streets. And they've recently, um, actually, I'm gonna put a link in the chat to a post we did on this a year ago, warning about it, but they've now announced the locations and there's, they've already started to put some of them up. The scale of them is just outrageous. and. So, um, and in, in certain neighborhoods like the Upper East Side, they're doing, they're saying, oh, well, there's a capacity issue, but there is no capacity issue. So the only real reasons that they would need this is for surveillance or for um, the wireless companies wanting to compete with the cable companies. So um, the, the New York City is on fire on this issue. It is so exciting to me because they are really waking up there. All these communi community groups getting involved in it and raising money for lawyers. And um, it's um, so, and if it happens in New York, it'll happen uh, across the country for sure. And this is despite the fact that the technology is, um, is not the optimal technology. Even Tom Wheeler, who was the former chair of the FCC and also for 12 years head of the Cellular Telephone Industry Association has said, um, we must invest in future-proof technology, meaning fiber. And he said, wireless may be a last resort option in the most isolated areas, but it should not be a first resort for most of America. Nonetheless, this technology is still rolling out across the country and getting worse and worse. We did a paper, National Institute of Science, Science Law and Public Policy, um, published a paper written by Tim Sheckley called Reinventing Wires, the Future of Landlines and Networks that explains the history of how we came to champion a, an in very inferior technology on many, many grounds, um, to, you know, over, over superior technology. And we, um, it went through about 12 or 13 different areas where 
on any one of them individually, you could say you could justify hardwiring over wireless. Now it's not just the health issues. It's the energy utilization, it's the speed, it's the reliability, it's the um, the value for the money, cybersecurity, all these many different um, areas where from a technological perspective, this technology makes no sense. So if people want to read that paper, it's called Reinventing Wires, the Future of Landlines and Networks. And Tim can talk a little bit about, um, Tim wrote the paper um, and I worked very closely with him on it, but um, Tim, do you want to say a few words about well, the- wait, I, want, I want to clarify one thing. Uh -huh. You said in Manhattan, 4,000 towers, is that right? Yeah, here, I just put a link in the chat. Um, and so far they've just, um, they put a few up They've just announced eight, announced 18 locations in Carnegie Hill, which is kind of stupid of them because they're a pretty educated uh, group up in Carnegie Hill, and they're really rising up against this. And, you know, on all, whatever grounds they can, you know, whether it's historic preservation or other things, right now under the Telecom Act of 1996, Section 704 of that act has some language snuck in at the last moment by lobbyists for the telecom industry that prevents um, governments from resisting antennas on health or environmental grounds. Right. So they can't that was, be, that was that's Clinton gotta change. Gore, by the way. That was Clinton and Gore. That's Isn't right. Was Clinton and Gore. That's that's right. And that's got it, that's gotta change. There are two real core issues here. And one is that, and the second is the fraudulent exposure guidelines that um, the FD, FCC puts out that are completely non-protective. And they 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 get away with it. They've they very the science going back on this, it, you know, goes back to the 1940s. And I have a post I can put in also of like the government studies. I mean, like about 10 different government departments and agencies have published studies over decades showing the harmful effects in great detail. Yet they've allowed a trillion dollar wireless industry to emerge, and you know, it's now integral to our economy and jobs and um we, it, we've made some mistakes and we need to reverse it and we need to hardwire and um tim maybe you would want to talk say a few minutes a few words about the um the hardwiring necessity yes. tim and then we're going to go to mark and eric who have not yet spoken and then mary and mimi so go ahead tim and mark is quite a technical expert as well so uh, uh, tell us please well, we published it, Reinventing Wires in uh, 2000, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> 2018. Yeah. Um, it's four years ago, but uh, at that point, what the main emphasis of it was to rec to push the idea that uh, forward that every uh, everybody in the United States should have a fiber uh, optic access d directly, a gigabit fiber, and that is. Uh, if it's not fiber, it's not broadband. And that's the slogan of the Fiber uh, Association. Uh, and I firmly believe that. And that's what the paper, uh, really the, the main thesis of the paper. I never envisioned it could actually happen this quickly, but it is actually happening. And it's happening because of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, in, in part, but it's uh, loosened up a lot of federal money. There's many billions of dollars being put into it right now. Only, uh, interestingly, mostly in rural areas, because those are the completely unserved areas uh, all over the United States and, uh, and, and here in Colorado, whereas people, uh, cities, urban areas have had this mediocre wireless service and, and, and uh, a lot of competition with, from cable companies and with also, uh, me, uh, you know, in, in, inadequate service, but um they still have some service, but the, the the rural America has had no service, and now they are getting the fiber first. So that is great news. Um, we but we still need to get the fiber to everybody, and it should be locally owned and controlled, not owned by corporations. It's right. a public utility like water and sewer service. It should be a public uh, utility. <clears throat> so as with electricity, which we want to come from solar and wind. And go uh, over wires uh, in microgrids. You're, you're, it's a parallel situation with with the um, um, uh, EMF and 5G and, the, and that and that wireless service. Yeah, my, go to wires. my next uh, next paper will be one of the next papers will be reinventing electricity. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, Mark, 
Uh, Mark Roast, um, uh, go ahead, please. Thank you. So, Timothy, um, is the is the equipment that you talked about ready for production? How much capital would it take to produce and start deployment? And somewhat differently, can a given installation support sufficient solar on the roof and on canopies over parking and driveways, plus storage is needed to uh, fit, to provide to meet all the needs of both house of building and vehicles associated with it. And can it tap weather forecasts and accommodate varying demand from users? Like say, okay, I'm going on a trip. I want the car full, because the other assumption here is that all cars get converted. We don't wait for turnover, fleet turnover. We convert the existing fleets, and we um, use solar at half the price and batteries at a third of the price of what they are today um, to make this thing become a gold rush. Well, all of the the, the things you ask about are, are true. I mean, those are, are uh, there is a there is plenty of capacity or uh, rooftop space available um, to power everything. Although I mean, your equipment, your will your equipment manage it, and if it's properly managed, yeah, it has to be okay. managed, and that's why our emphasis is on the control system for all of this. The MM Good. system I mentioned earlier is for specifically to control homes, buildings, and microgrids. And um, when could that be in production? Well, we have prototypes being built as we speak, and we've. Uh, it all depend on money. Uh, this is is not a business venture on my part. This is a, uh, a, a back. The 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 theory behind it is it is based on open standards, international standards, by ISO and IEC, and it's and the many of the parts have already been approved. Some more parts are being written right as we speak. And prototypes are being built to test it out as we speak, but the, uh, um, the, the the how fast it will roll out depends on funding. And the and the fortunately the uh, the Department of Energy is putting some money in a lot of money, billions of dollars, into underserved communities and Indian tribes and uh, 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 in in the West, and that will be the test bed for making this work. And the rural electric associations are very supportive of it, as opposed to the investor-owned utilities, which supply 70% of the power in this country, they are against it. Wow, yeah. very interesting. So your grant that you're hoping to apply for that you're in the process is for 12 million. What will that, where will that get you? Well, that will get uh, quite a, a number of, of communities uh, uh, working on this, uh, you know, operating with microgrids that our solar microgrids that that can prove out the the technology and and the second part of the strategy is not just open international standards but non proprietary open source software to uh, to make these uh, uh, Emma controllers uh, adapt to virtually every kind of conceivable appliance that might be in a home or a building and manage energy according to the needs of the user. That's the theory behind it, and we want to stimulate an open source market, just like the Linux operating system has been so successful, based on the same model. We want to. I put my contact, my email address in there, and we're doing batteries and solar uh, breakthrough technology. So, I'd like to work with you, coordinate with you on that. Okay, you guys, great. Connect. Hey, I, um, Army. Um, um, can yes. I interject for a second? Timothy, yeah. please read your chat. I've got an important message for you. Thank you. That's all. Go ahead. Who? Timothy, that was just on. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Timothy, there's a message for you in the chat. Okay. I'll try try to do that and talk at the same time if I have to. <laughs> well, you can talk and chew gum at the same time. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, Somebody see in the chat. Eric Lazarus, you're you're a New Yorker. Uh, go ahead and jump in, please. Eric, are you unmuted? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, um, oh, hi. Okay. So the question is, besides the actual solar panels on people's roofs, what else is needed to make a microgrid? Can you kind of just give us like sixty seconds on what the rest of the technology? Obviously, if you don't have power locally. Nothing you do is going to make it, you know, independent. But besides, besides the rooftops, 
what else is the what other components are there in a microgrid? Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the, the, there's the, the, the there's the home your home uh, or building your uh, appliances in the uh, whatever you have your solar panels your batteries those are the vital components in the controller uh, and then the neighborhood the important part of a microgrid is a community and so it's got to be a logical grouping of homes and buildings uh, what we envision with the Emma system is probably around thirty houses or maybe. Um, even more, but uh, that, that's an optimal size because it, it requires cooperation. To make a microgrid work, you have to have cooperation between the people that live there. The, uh, there has to be some kind of community basis for it. And that's why these good place to try this out is, uh, you know, uh, in the, um, some of the communities in the Southwest, uh, particularly Indian, um, um, uh, uh, the uh, Native American communities there, the tribes have no, uh, a lot of them don't have any service, so they are, but they have a very strong sense of community. So, um, so I, I live on a cul-de-sac. There are 12 houses, uh, 10 Jews. So I should have a pretty good chance, right? Yeah, yeah, and there's it's doing working out in Puerto Rico too. There's a group of uh, the uh, the uh, Interstate Re Re Renewable Energy Council is sponsoring some microgrid development in uh, in Puerto Rico because that's been such a, a bizarre debacle down there with the uh, uh, original investor-owned utility and the the very uh, um, bungled. Uh, in implementation of their power grid it just what shows here real quickly what you're saying here this is really interesting and i've never heard this before is that we could do microgrids simultaneously with electric supply and with cable right yeah well with fiber fiber yeah. so yeah. That, that that has not really been i have not seen that discussed um well, it's, uh, a, it's a very interesting uh Segue there. It brings together telecommunications and po electric power. Those are basic utilities, and the uh, the uh, uh, interesting enough, the 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 uh, the utilities that are putting it in uh, are are the, uh, the rural electric associations that are owned by their customers. They're they're not uh, investor owned. They're owned by the customers, and so they don't have an incentive to. Um, make money off of them. They have a, a strong incentive to supply good source of power and communications, and they have the rights of way for all the uh, electric lines already. They were, uh, and they uh, can easily string optical fiber in those uh, um, in their territories. So that's a perfect place to start. That's an amazing. That's an amazing breakthrough. Uh, to talk out if you're still on the call for the indigenous. That's a that's a big deal. I, I had never heard that discussed before. Tim, um, how um, is what how is your what you're developing, Tim, differentiated from say the microgrid at universities like University of Colorado? Yeah, well, or the others? first What's the different? original term microgrid it can mean a lot of things. I mean, it's a it's a, but the uh, the ones that have been that go way back many years are are campuses. That's a logical place for a microgrid. And so, whether it's a university campus or a corporate campus. The best examples, you know, MIT is a microgrid. The UC San Diego is a well-known one. Uh, they uh, uh, even here in Boulder, the University of Colorado campus is a microgrid in a sense. They can detach it from the power grid, and they have their own independent power plant. But it's not a, it's not all solar at this point. It's it's just a conventional microgrid, but. Um, it's a larger microgrid, but ideally it's a smaller community. Like, uh, um, and, and we've seen most of the experience in microgrids have been on islands, uh, on on remote communities, and say in Alaska or Canada, or, or uh, places where they don't have a connection to the electric power grid or a good one, they have to uh, augment that with uh, local power. And, Amazing. And so the, that's where they developed it first. Excellent. Follow up. Um, um, real quickly, then we go uh, Mary, um, Amimi, Justin, and Ron. And then would we be wise to we're go deeper in? Would we be wise to put them in in places where there's often a lot of storms, so that the press will cover that these places never lost power? Um, it would seem like a very important use case to say, "Oh, look." 
if you have these microgrids, now you're resilient against this uh, heavy weather that you had. Does that idea make any sense? That's a, that's exactly what's happening. Yes, in fact, that was during the super storm, storm Sandy in New York. There were some communities that out, that had that, and they stayed up. There was, you know, this, the state of New Jersey had the most at the time the most rooftop solar in the country, but most of it was grid connected directly, and it was not microgrids. It was not self supporting, and the people did not have access to their solar power without the power grid operating. So people don't realize that, that, that those solar panels are useless unless uh, uh, if, if they depend on the power grid. Amazing. Uh, Mary, so, Mary uh, Mimi, Justin, and Ron, and Wendy. Mary, are you unmuted? Sorry, Mimi, I'll unmute you. Justin, we still have 68 people on the call. Um, very, very interesting, uh, Timothy, really powerful stuff. Uh, Camilla, will you have an organization for people to connect with that you could put in the chat or have you already? Um, I will. I will. Yeah. Please do put it in the chat. Okay, uh, Mary, Mary, real quick, please. Mary Butler. Um, yeah. Yeah, go, please. I, I just on a quick point so i wanted to bring up is uh number one these 5g towers it's strange how they just pop up and they don't even ask the community if they want them there right and then um same as nuclear when we talk right. about micro grids we got to find a language that makes the power companies not attack us and the, the language should be um things like hey what if we create micro grids you don't have to build transformers. Instead, all of our homes are your transformers. And you can still make money by being the person that has to service all this electronics to keep our micro community working. All right. Very good. Thank you, Mary. Interesting. Uh, Mimi? Thanks, everyone. Um, the, the issue with solar is that it doesn't make enough money and, and all renewables, it does not make enough corporate money. So uh, <laughs> no, but yes. that's true. That's why absolutely. Um, that's why Governor Newsom killed it. And um, also something I mentioned yesterday, which is so important. I didn't hear anyone say this today, but um, we can no longer use the wording green energy because that includes nuclear. So yeah. we have to say renewables, renewables, renewables all the time. and. Um, a quick update in California solar is that three environmental groups have asked for a rehearing on the um, horrible NEM3 decision. Um, there is a great article in the New York, uh, excuse me, in the LA Times, and I'm trying to find a free article I can share with all of you. It's I in haven't... the chat. It's in the oh, chat. someone's put in the, someone already put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much, Ron. I was looking for a free article because I have, a, I have, you know, Apple subscriptions. So thanks, everyone. That's all I... Yeah, oh, and so, yeah, and so, so sorry, just one more thing. So Newsom, you know, he's all talk on the environment and the utilities. I mean, he killed the clean air initiative, right? I mean, so he doesn't give a darn about clean air in California. And now he's done this with solar. I mean, it's just so shocking everybody. So um, I, got, I know several people who would not vote for Gavin Newsom because of that. Thank you. You got to hand it to California. and uh, they, they simultaneously extended the life of Diablo Canyon, which could easily blow up and wipe out the whole state. And then they said, then they, in the next breath, uh, 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 killed rooftop solar. Total well, I just, I'm so sorry. So I didn't want to confuse anyone. That was Prop 30 in California. That was the clean air initiative that Democrats were for, Republicans were against, and Newsom were against as well. So it's just made him, I'm sorry, I can't think of another word. It's made him very cocky and, and um, it, it's very annoying. I mean, he's one of these greenwashing politicians. So thanks, everyone. I'll Thank end you, my rant Mary. there. And thanks for that link, Ron. I appreciate it. You're 100% right. And now we're linking uh, uh, the, the safe energy movement with the, uh, um, the EMF movement, extremely important. Uh, uh, Camilla, we're really glad you're on to do this with us. Uh, uh, Justin and, and Ron Leonard. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming on, Timothy. Uh, one of the things I wanted to raise 
besides the fact that my bosses are involved both in the critique of the Stanford MIT resiliency study and uh, also setting the renewable portfolio standard for California, or at least helping develop it, uh, is uh, there's a concept of last mile service. That's the thing that uh, essentially it has always uh, been the uh, complaint of any infrastructure provider is, oh, we don't want to stretch out to the end. So it's nice to say uh, that uh, we are helping the uh, indigenous tribes and those uh, in rural communities with fiber again, because that actually is a hearkening back to the, the telecom as it used to be over a hundred years ago when we felt that everybody actually deserved a level playing field in society. So I'm, I'm glad to hear all that. And um, what I wanted to ask about is your interest in, uh, say, other kinds of um, issues of cities and public-private partnerships. Like Google is wanting to build a microgrid, but they're wanting essentially San Jose to pay for it. And uh, so what do you have as far as ideas for how communities can do this from the uh, ground up and sort of take a, a little more initiative rather than be in the passenger seat? Well, that's a real good question. I don't, I don't think that this should be, a, a, that we should rely on private corporations to do this for profit corporations. It's not going to work. Um, that is, uh, it, this, these microgrids particularly have to be based on a community, uh, some kind of common, a co common interest, a community uh, uh, basis. And, and that's why I like the, uh, the rural electric associations, because they're based on that concept. But the um, uh, Google, uh, uh, th there's no way uh, these private corporations have one purpose that is to make money for their shareholders and their management that's their primary purpose and they are uh, never going to do this uh, correctly i don't think the fiber should be owned by and operated by them i do not think that the electric power should be uh that's not not the way to raise uh capital okay uh, Ron Leonard, Ron is one, uh, uh, Camilla and, and, and Tim, Ron is one of our great experts on solar and uh, is in the, has been in the solar business uh, for a long, long time. Tim, might you want to talk about net metering? And um, we discussed that earlier today. What are your thoughts right. on that? Well, let, let Ron, Camilla, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Ron will touch on that and go and go to Tim. Okay. Uh, and you guys should Sorry. be, uh, okay. Go, go for it, Ron. Well, you're not, all that hoopla, you're muted. Hold on, man. Okay. <laughs> all right, there you go. Hold on, man. So I think we're mixing apples and oranges. So when we're talking about uh, microgrid, uh, I, you know, I did my first microgrid in 1975. This guy called Edison, he did the first ever microgrid in Manhattan in the late 1800s. Uh, microgrids are not a solution. It's just an action that you do when you move electricity around. The solution that we're talking about that is a solution is distributed energy. And however that is used, you can create microgrids out of it, but I'll give you the California example, the distributed energy that occurred from 1.5 million solar roofs in California, some of them with batteries, were used in a virtual power plant by the manufacturers of the battery systems and saved the California grid twice last year in 100 degree temperatures. So the, all these technologies are here now. We don't have to reinvent anything. We don't have to create anything new. It exists, it's here. The problem that we have in terms of implementing this at scale is that an, initially, if you wanted to sell power on the grid, you had to register as a utility. And one of the people that registered as a utility because they got pissed off at a state, which was Georgia, not letting them on the grid was Apple Computer. And others have followed that, including uh, Tesla, who registered as a utility in uh, Texas to combine battery systems and sell power back to the grid. So all this exists. The solution is here. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to implement. Now, what we're talking about in net metering is the really a uh, nasty portion of what's occurred when uh, three utilities, I think it was three, might've been four, in California got together a slush fund of $7.2 million and educated the California commission on what should be done with net metering 
which in effect seemingly was to make it go away by decreasing the cost of reimbursement for any electricity that goes back on the grid from your solar system on your roof that you paid for, you give it back to them at five to eight cents, they get to sell it for 33 cents. Does that make sense? Don't think so. That's neither fair, equitable, or smart. And the last portion of it is a recent ruling. The California Public Utilities Commission wants to have four more gigawatts of new capacity to ensure grid reliability of renewables. That's in addition to the 11.5 gigawatts procurement regulators ordered in 2021. Well, on one hand, you want more renewables. On the other hand, you're killing any more renewables that you can get on the grid because California now produces 10% of its power from solar rooftops. That's an yeah. enormous number. That's it's just a real enormous. standout. It's so clear. Here on the one hand, the CPUC last month uh, uh, slashes a, a deep knife into the back of rooftop solar. And then they turn around the next month and they say, we want four more gigawatts of solar, but we don't want it on rooftops. We want corporations to own it, not people with their own roof. It's so clear and so obvious, like what Mimi said. Tim, I, I think uh, you chew in here to what Ron and uh, Camilla, what Ron has put out. Well, I don't, I don't want to get in an argument here. Um, I'm just going to, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say something uh, there that <clears throat> what you guys have been talking about is a, is the big grid, what I call the big grid. The problem with the grid is that it needs to be broken down into smaller pieces. It's too complex and it's never going to work this way. Uh, you're never going to run a, run, a, a, run it the way that uh, that it's uh, this is being conceived because the the problem is that the uh, investor-owned utilities um, uh, do not want to see rooftop solar anywhere, if they, or if they did, it would be owned or controlled by them. I don't. I think that every solar uh, array, whether it's on your roof or anywhere else, should have a battery and should be focused on self-consumption and not selling power to the grid. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do we have, and Camilla, you're probably the one to answer this. Do we have a parallel microgrid movement in, in, um, in 5G in telecommunications with the, the decentralized solar movement? Do we have, par do we have a parallel tracks here? Yeah, that's what fiber is all about. So we should, piggyback the fiber movement onto the rooftop solar movement and then, and the microgrid power movement yeah yeah the fi the fiber and and this form of power we're ta I'm talking about is is basically giving it back to the the user to the people not to the corporations that are uh, trying to colonize it and uh, and what is happening uh, you know is uh, the the solar, uh, people, you know, the so it was too easy. Net metering made the solar uh, installers happy because they could just go out and put these cheap uh, inverters on houses and 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 solar panels and walk away and to sell 100% of the power to the grid at, um, under net metering tariffs. The problem is that makes solar the most expensive form of energy. Um, and that's what's limiting solar right now. So we need to get rid of net metering and phase it out and go to self-consumption. And are you talking about batteries, batteries? for every every solar installation? And and maybe we'll structure some of it into microgrids if it works, if it's appropriate for the local situation, or maybe not. Are you advocating that every home that puts in solar also puts in a battery? Absolutely. Uh, and I've heard, I'm gonna go back to Ron in a minute, but I've heard also, uh, who know, I had a conversation with someone that's telling me they're very optimistic about getting rid of lithium and cobalt and making batteries with sodium. Is that realistic? Are you asking me? Mark is giving <laughs> Mark is giving us a double thumbs up here. Uh, Mark, do you know 
something we don't about uh yeah yeah we uh, we started with sodium we we have been exploring the sodium battery and we've now gotten to the point where we're going to be testing solid state batteries and we're trying to get our hands on some titanium or nickel mesh or expanded metal to use and i think i found a lead for that to use to uh, improve the results and actually have a breakthrough and we're looking at $48 a kilowatt hour for batteries, but guess what? If they're made in the United States with North American materials, there's a $45 per kilowatt hour subsidy. So that makes a net cost for the batteries of $3 a kilowatt hour. And then we're looking at 20 cents a watt for the solar instead of 50 cents to a dollar. Um, Camilla, did you wanna jump in on that? No, I let Tim talk about batteries. Okay, yeah. all right. so. We've got yeah, it. Let me comment on it. I think but the battery him... technology is moving really fast. It's very exciting. And I think it's going to get, we're going to get rid of these rare materials that are so controversial. I think that, I think we're going to have a, a, a good battery business down the road here soon. So if we can integrate cheaper batteries using non exotic, what's the term for non exotic? Common materials for batteries. Uh, and, and segue that or, or, or piggyback that with the telecommunications grids, um, that takes us up, uh, that takes us to another uh, level, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I think that we, we also have to, to take a very hard look at this emphasis we're seeing on large scale generation and transmission. I am a, a really a, a feel very, uh, um, much opposed to the idea of large wind farms, large solar farms, offshore wind farms. I think these are bad ways to go. I, I, nuclear power, same problem. It's all about the big bucks that these corporations want to make, and they don't want the they don't want it, the power to the people. Uh, Ron Leonard, did you want to jump in on that? Wait, wait, wait. Ron, Ron, hold on. You're muted. Sorry. Okay. So yeah. let me agree with you and tell you the facts. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission years ago put out a wonderful graphic that shows where you put a unit of fossil fuel into a generator at the central power station. And by the time you get it to the last mile to your house, only 20% of that energy that you put up there enters back in your area as electricity. That's 80% waste. We cannot run a system that way. It makes no sense. That's what distributed energy is all about. We can put clean energy producing product, typically solar, in the load zone, create energy cheaper than the fossil fuel plant did way back there with no waste and have the grid more equitably used for everyone. So this is not a fantasy. This is what we are doing. This is what we have the technology to do and the numbers prove that we're right. 100%, 100% with you. And if we can have clean, cheap batteries that don't use exotic metals, that use common metals and, and, and have locally generated electricity and microgrids for telecommunications on uh, as part of that grid, uh, then we're in a brave new world. Is that right? That's uh, logical yeah. and it makes economic sense. Tim, you agree? Terrific. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, then we've, solved, we've solved the world's problems and uh, 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 we won't have any more. No, we'll, we'll be back again next week. This has been another, a second hour. Um, we don't have to break, Steve. You just keep it going. Uh, as long as you're, you let me know how long you want to keep going because we've got Hands well, go I, I'm, I'm completely embarrassed. I gave my host powers up to Tim, and I've been trying to talk to him in chat. So, Tim, Julie, is that how you how do you pronounce your last name? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I don't you know, know how to open a participants list. Uh, I saw your uh, your message. Yeah. Do you know how to open a participants list? Yeah. So go ahead and open it and find my name and three dots next to that, select make host. 
find your name. Yeah, <laughs> Steve Caruso. Yeah, or Steve we'll Engineer. Stop and we'll continue. We're going to continue this Steve engineer. discussion. It's embarrassing. <laughs> That's all right. Um, um, do we have a dog barking in the 